Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session. It's on community networks. Uh, we've entitled it Complementary Solutions, Innovations and Partnerships to Bridge the Digital Divide. My name is Lina Green, and I'm the CEO and founder of Angels of Impact. We are an organization that funds and offers technical assistance to community-based enterprises enterprises that are tackling UN SDG 1, no poverty, five gender equality, and 12 responsible production and consumption. Uh, in my previous life, uh, since 1986, I've been working on bridging the digital divide. Uh, I've worked in many internet organizations, several of which are here today, uh, and have been working the, pre the remaining of my years a lot in terms of the social enterprise space. And thanks to ICEA, where I'm a member of and a regional council member, and I'm also the co-convener of the Technology uh, Innovations for Sustainable Development platform, which we will discuss today. So in order to set the context, because we are having a side event uh, to the issue around the conference at the UN, is how important community networks and social enterprises are important to this issue of bridging the digital divide. So to set the context of today's session, we're gonna open with Carlos Re Moreno, who is the co-lead for local network programs at the Association for Progressive Communications. And he will be talking to us today about towards meaningful internet connectivity, inputs to goal number nine. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laina. Let me, let me share my screen, I don't know. If the participants can already see it. Yes, we can. Sure. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much. And um, there, the, the, as Lina was saying, I wanted to to talk a bit and unpacking, right? Like this, uh, the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development is reviewing uh, some of the Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, uh, one of the four that is reviewing is Goal Nine. Um, and uh, that is about build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Uh, one of the ways, one of the indicators that are looking at or one of the goals is significantly increase access to information and communication technologies and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in, leader, in least developed countries by 2020. But many countries are looking at this, many regions, uh, not only through least developed countries, but through the, the region overall. Um, and this is the, the goal profile that is being shared as the framework of the forum. And at the bottom, you can see that is the target that is you know, closer to, to completion for 2030, right? Population cover by a mobile network is the way uh, internet is included on the framework of the, or access to the internet is included on the framework of the SDGs. Um, this is also part of the profile, and you can see a great evolution uh, from 2015 to 2019 on the population cover by different technologies in uh, the different uh, sub-regions within Asia, Asia Pacific, right? So in, in East and Northeast Asia, pretty much everyone is covered by a 4G network. A bit less people are covered by a 4G network in North and Central Asia. But still, they are either covered by 3G or 2G. Very few people, according to the way this is being measured, has no connection. But if we start digging a bit deeper into this, right, uh, and we look at the uh, reports from the global, well, from the industry association for mobile network operators and their mobile economy reports from 2020 to 2022, we can see that there is a bit of a plateauing on the number of mobile broadband users, right? Despite them being covered and despite the, the coverage gap reducing or remaining, but remaining quite persistent at the same time, there is a massive usage gap, right? There is a massive number of people um, in the region is still below 50% of internet users as of 2020 one in this case, which is the data included in the report in 2022. So despite a lot of progress in the SDG 9, maybe SDG 9 is not looking at the, at the correct indicator to measure what is the impact of, of the internet, right? Because 
as many people have been looking at from the pandemic, uh, there has been a massive widening gap, not only from those who have coverage, but also those with coverage that do not benefit from the internet. Um, during the pandemic, we did realize that those of us who have access to um, proper internet connectivity, we did suffer. And there are many indicators that look at this way less the impact of the pandemic on our lives and those of our loved ones and their economic activities way less than those that couldn't use the, the internet properly. And one of the barriers that many people point out in a framework of many for connectivity is affordability, right? And in the in Asia Pacific as a region, is not doing, let's say, is, do, is doing relatively well, right? Is uh, the, this this broadband affordability uh, indicator that was developed by the Alliance for Affordable Internet in, com in combination, coordination with the Broadband Commission, was determining that broadband was affordable if one gigabyte uh, of data was less than 2% of the only disposable income uh, of, of the people in a, in, in, in a particular country, right? And many countries in the region are even, even below 1% of, uh, of that disposable income for one gigabyte of data. However, uh, one gigabit of data is very little compared to actual and predicted uh, utilization of mobile broadband uh, compared to, to the targets, both from the current existing one from the, uh, from the broadband commission, as well as the next target that they are planning to be met by 2026, that is looking instead of to one gigabyte to five gigabytes now. Currently in Southeast Asia, the minimum, you know, which is where the lowest uh, predicted or uh, usage of, of the internet is sitting uh, in the blue curve at five gigabytes, right? So it's really, sorry, at 10 gigabytes. So it's really one gigabyte or five gigabyte for 2% of the disposable income, a good indicator as well. Well, not quite because we are already at 10 gigabytes. Uh, in 2022 in Southeast Asia, and even more in other regions at 15 at the global average, right? If we look using the very same database from the Alliance for Affordable Internet, and we update it for 10 gigabytes, then there are already some countries, you know, appearing above that 2% uh, affordability barrier, with some countries even going above 3% and about 10%. And this is really problematic because here we are taking country averages, right? We are not taking the breakdown of the different, you know, income uh, barrier, uh, income the uh, income percentages within the country. You, you know, as, as you know, there are people that are way richer than others in a particular country. So there are many people below that, uh, even, you know, when you look deeper into the data, there are many who, struggling or farther in relation to affordability. Uh, but also in the region, there are barriers around the device affordability. This is again data from the Alliance for the Portable Internet in East Asia and the Pacific, as well as South Asia. The affordability of the device is above 20% and even above 50% in South Asia, right? With the affordability of the device, be more expensive even as compared to 2021, right? So things are becoming more expensive for the users as uh, than they were in the past. There has been frameworks looking at this and trying to capture meaningful connectivity. You know, uh, the, the Alliance for Affordable Internet started looking at it. Uh, the, the ITU took out that uh, meaningful, connectivity, uh, meaningful connectivity and is looking at uh, new frameworks that has ta are taking into account not only for not only uh, usage affordability, device affordability, and other measures into a meaningful connectivity uh, framework to measure to measure all these components that should we recommend is adopted by the uh, by the by the sustainable development goals, provided that there is no way that uh, coverage is a measure of 
absolutely anything to make it meaningful or as a way of it having any development impact on people. And, but then if mobile coverage is not, you know, and the current mobile coverage and the mobile, co and the mobile uh, usage is not enough and, and we are, you know, and, and those type of operators and models are showing that they are struggling and plateauing in providing coverage and meaningful access into rural and remote areas and to, you know, the, the, those with less income in the region, then what can we do, right? And this is a picture of Ms. Doreen Bolt and Martin, who is the Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union, who last year, she said, connecting the first 53% wasn't so hard. Connecting the remaining 47% is a different ball game. And business as usual will not work, right? Kind of pointing towards the need to look at other complementary models beyond mobile broadband, because mobile broadband is actually, uh, as I said, plateauing and not finding the ways of providing affordable connectivity and meaningful connectivity to those in, in uh, around the world and in particular in Asia, in Asia Pacific. So it's interesting because already these complementary access, uh, complementary access solutions are being recognized widely by the International Telecommunications Union in the two biggest conference that the union held last year, the World Telecommunications Development Conference, as well as the plenipotentiary in the resolutions, they do incorporate the need to look and to create enabling environments for these complementary access solutions, right? Resolution 37, bridging the digital divide of the World Telecommunications Development Conference, as well as resolution 139 on the use of telecommunications and information and communications technologies to bridge the digital divide and build an inclusive information society, do mention these solutions and the way to facilitate them and to enable them. At the regional level, also in 2022, this is a, a report, a paper series from the Asian Development Bank from December, who is looking at last mile connectivity, addressing the affordability frontier. It does contain uh, also uh, uh, references to not only complementary access solutions, but to community networks themselves, solutions that we are gonna be hearing uh, in, the, in the next, with the next speaker. Also uh, in Asia, internet society, the, we, we will be hearing from uh, as well, together with ESCA, uh, the, uh, is, has been holding uh, sessions on community networks all the way from time 2019. The last one in August 2021, where an Asia Pacific Regional Community Network Summit was held, looking at innovating policy, uh, policy making, right? So just to say that the, 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 the way that SDG 9 is being looked at is not, uh, is not really looking any measure of, although it's showing progress, is not really showing any progress that has to do with development per se, or with tackling the real issues that the people are having because coverage is not enough. Traditional models of looking at coverage, such as those from mobile operators, are struggling to provide meaningful access to those uh, with, less, uh, with less income. And, and new and complementary models need to be looked at and are already being looked at in one way or another from different actors in the region, including the Asian Development Bank and ESCAP, and from the support or with the recognition in 2022 from the ITU to look into these models. So with that, uh, yeah, I want to pass it back to you, Laina, mm -hmm. uh, as a way of continuing with the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. I think that was a very uh, useful framing because a lot of times people talk about connectivity without delving a little bit deeper in terms of the affordability and uh, meaningful connectivity. So thank you for breaking that down. And it was encouraging to see that the ITU is also now talking about the need for comp complementary access uh, solutions. So let us dive in next to uh, Pak Gustav Hariman Iskandar. He's the CEO and founder of Common Room in Indonesia. So this will give you a really good example of what do we mean by community networks. Uh, Pak Gustav, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you. Terima kasih, Bu Lena. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Gustav. Greetings from uh, Bandung. I will try to share some of our experience in developing the community network projects in Indonesia, as well as to initiate the school of community networks that uh, develop in around uh, 10 different uh, provinces in Indonesia uh, with the uh, generous support and assistance from APC, uh, ISIF uh, Asia, as well as FCDO through the digital access uh, program. Uh, hopefully, you can already uh, see uh, our slides. So, this picture is actually from the uh, uh, Chiptagular uh, Indigenous uh, um, Community Village in uh, West Java, in particular in the southern coastal of uh, a border between West Java and uh, Banten Province. And this is where we started our um, community network projects in around 2019. Um, as you probably noticed, uh, uh, during, during the since the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, the internet connectivity has already become uh, 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 essential uh, tools that facilitate not only daily communications but uh, many uh, activities. Uh, starting from public administration, health service, education, and so on, and so on. And uh, in Indonesia, uh, there has been a significant growth of internet penetrations, but uh, the digital divide challenges are still uh, exist among the public in general, in particular uh, in rural areas and remote places, as well as um, remote islands uh, and some underserved uh, areas uh, in uh, actually also exist in uh, urban uh, uh, context. Some of the challenges uh, mainly uh, focus uh, with many issues. Uh, in Indonesia, we have so many uh, islands, uh, so the geographical uh, condition is uh, very broad and diverse. Uh, in some areas, uh, that there are reports made by the Ministry of Finances that uh, more than 20,000 village in Indonesia still um, haven't got any proper internet connectivity and electric supply. So there are a uh, lack of adequate internet uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are also large difference in bandwidth costs between outside and within Java islands. And uh, unavailability of uh, appropriate and affordable device is also uh, some particular challenge, uh, including the inability to produce local content and local knowledge. So people in remote areas didn't see uh, the, relev the relevance of internet for their uh, daily life. This challenge also include the lack of digital literacy, uh, digital skill, and gender gaps in many different uh, regions in Indonesia. So as for example, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, there are more than uh, 42,000 students in West Java cannot get internet service and uh, we have a learning loss uh, because the student um, cannot take part in the remote uh, education at that time. Uh, currently, the education slowly become uh, normal again, but still the internet connectivity in raw areas and remote places uh, uh, still a big problem uh, in our context. And in uh, many uh, different uh, uh, situations, uh, remote areas, including the rural areas and remote places, have multiple impact from uh, local uh, challenge and complexity. Uh, this include the impact of climate change, the increasing gap between urban and rural development, the impact from uh, population growth, uh, like our government uh, explain this as a, a demographic bonus, but from our observations, this uh, demographic bonus is actually going to be a, a demographic uh, burden uh, because uh, there are uh, an adequate uh, population growth. And uh, we also know that there are still uh, impact uh, uh, from the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, outbreak. And in the past couple of years, we also started to recognize there are uh, specific impact uh, coming from the unintended consequences from the internet and digital media in the form of uh, distribution of uh, hoax news, uh, uh, illegal and illicit content, uh, disinformation, misinformation, and so on and so on. So this uh, is a growing challenge 
that are somehow happens in our uh, region. And uh, in this uh, regards, uh, community networks is one of the complementary solutions to address the digital divide in our uh, countries. Uh, from our uh, understanding, the community networks is basically internet infrastructure that are built by the people, maintained by the people, and utilized by the uh, people. And uh, by uh, developing uh, this uh, uh, framework, we uh, uh, develop uh, uh, a framework that are also set by together by our uh, fellow from uh, APC and uh, some uh, organization in Indonesia uh, that community-based internet infrastructure are supposed to be complied to um, uh, policy and regulations that are uh, uh, developed in our countries. It's supposed to be uh, safe and secure for not only for the operators, but also for the user uh, in terms of uh, affordability and uh, meaningful connectivity. Uh, this also has to be uh, something that are uh, in our uh, highlights. So in uh, doing the community network infrastructure development, we uh, developed the 5L uh, frameworks, which basically uh, uh, have a five important component. Like the first one is low tech, that the, the technology should be uh, available and accessible in local context. Uh, low energy means that because a lot of uh, rural areas in Indonesia still uh, doesn't have any proper electric uh, resources. So it's supposed to be uh, uh, have uh, effective and efficient in, uh, uh, energy uses. It's supposed to be low uh, maintenance, uh, low learning curve. Like everyone uh, have uh, easy access to learn and understand what is the internet infrastructure is all about and how to use and utilize the internet properly. And one uh, last but is very also important is uh, local support and commitment. Because without any uh, support and commitment from the local communities, local authorities, uh, it uh, somehow is, can be very challenging. So this is where we uh, develop our pilot project. We uh, developed the uh, first uh, community network project in 2019. And the second prototypes is uh, developed in uh, Chirachap in 2020 with uh, different uh, geographies. Uh, the community network infrastructure in Chittagalar is developed in the uh, montanary area where the uh, forest uh, canopy is very thick and uh, it's not easy to uh, access. And the second prototype is uh, developed in the coastal areas where the internet is uh, not really uh, accessible in the, area, in the region. So from here, uh, we did some evaluations and follow up. So by 2021st, we developed the School of Community Network uh, uh, project, uh, which uh, started to develop in 10 different provinces, including uh, Aceh, um, West Kalimantan, West Sulawesi, uh, Central Maluku, uh, Jayapura Regency, uh, Sukadana village in North Lombok, uh, Mataredi uh, village in Central Sumba, uh, Tembok village in Buleleng Regency in Bali, and as you see, uh, within this uh, widespread of uh, project outreach, we also uh, tend to collect uh, experiences and uh, learning experiences because from our uh, observations, there are no such thing as uh, one uh, policy and approach that fit for all in uh, every uh, region. Each area has its, its own uh, challenge and situations, including the needs. So we have to adjust our approach based on uh, local uh, needs and uh, challenges. But there are uh, core elements that are very important in our approach. Uh, uh, there are three, uh, brainware, software, and hardware. Uh, from our experience, um, to operate software and hardware are relatively easy uh, to develop the uh, passive infrastructure. Let's say uh, it can be uh, run uh, very uh, in very short periods of time, but to uh, develop the brainware is uh, quite challenging. Uh, there are areas that can uh, learn very fast, but there are some uh, communities that need uh, some time to learn and understand how uh, to build the a community network infrastructure. So this is uh, one of the challenges that we have uh, faced uh, during our uh, project development uh, periods. 
And for the School of Community Network, we develop uh, curricula and training materials. Uh, up to this uh, moment, we have uh, 10 uh, modules for our trainings with the guidance, guidance, uh, guidance from um, uh, APC. And currently, we also so uh, working on a new module uh, to uh, develop uh, training materials on internet and disaster risk reductions because most of our project locations is located in the disaster prone uh, areas. So this is some of examples that we de develop. This is the uh, infrastructure, the community-based infrastructure we develop in Ciptaglar, which uh, also embedded with the uh, solar panel as a uh, electric uh, source. Uh, this is the training uh, center that we developed in Chittaglar Village with the support from uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And uh, in 2002, we organized the first training of trainer of School of Community Networks, which then follow with uh, training activities in many different regions, uh, in particular to 10 uh, different areas that are uh, becoming a part of School of Community Network prog uh, program. And this is also one of the things uh, how we develop uh, engagement with local authorities in West Sulawesi. Uh, we managed to uh, sign MOU with nine village uh, leader to allocate a village fund uh, in order to develop the local internet infrastructure in their uh, region. In Sumba, we conducting training uh, that integrates internet infrastructure with solar panel resources. Uh, in West Kalimantan, we managed to build internet infrastructure so the local school can have access to uh, internet for their education. Uh, so since 2001, we organize a rural ICT camp, and this is the third rural ICT camp that we organize every year uh, from this uh, pro uh, annual uh, event. We consolidate uh, and facilitate trainings, uh, capacity building, uh, knowledge sharing and also a policy dialogue uh, in order to uh, support the community network development in Indonesia. And uh, for the passive infrastructure, we also uh, develop the uh, bamboo uh, tower uh, in collaborations with the Center for uh, Environment and Cultural uh, Products uh, at the Institute Technology of Bandung. And uh, currently, we also uh, develop another uh, bamboo tower in Chittaglar village uh, uh, to have a different approach in the technique and materials. And in Bali, we also collaborate closely uh, with the village uh, government to develop the uh, applications that can uh, facilitate the public administration in, in that uh, area. Apart from that, we also engage in uh, policy and regulation uh, uh, research and uh, uh, deliver uh, recommendations to our governments uh, in uh, Ministry of Communication as well as Ministry of uh, Villages. And as you see, the proportions of uh, curricula and training material is uh, like a more more of uh, most of the training material is technical. But we also include some uh, trainings on human rights and gender equality, uh, health and COVID-19 response, uh, digital literacy, business development, and uh, as well as uh, policy and regulations. And uh, this is the background uh, profile of uh, School of Community Network uh, training participants. So most of participants is uh, students, but there are also a number of participants from government officials, farmer, fisherman, uh, uh, housewife, uh, including ICT volunteer, and some uh, in some indigenous village, the local uh, shaman is also uh, taking part in the trainings. And in, in, in terms of gender uh, equality, we uh, have to admit that it is quite a challenge to uh, increase the participations of uh, female because of many uh, different barriers uh, from social to cultural barrier, but I think uh, from time to time to time, the, there are some uh, good uh, uh, examples of how uh, female participants can also take part in uh, community network development. And I, in the business uh, records in Chittaglar, we see that the community network infrastructure show a steady uh, growth uh, from time to time, uh, from 2020 until 2003, uh, there are some significant growth and up to now, the community network uh, infrastructure uh, services in Chittaglar is able to uh, 
uh, uh, get at least uh, $10,000 uh, a month uh, so we can uh, finance the uh, bandwidth, the local technic, uh, uh, technicians, operators, and so on. But you can see the biggest allocation are still goes to ISPs uh, because uh, based on uh, policy and regulations that we have uh, uh, comply in Indonesia, the, the, the schema for the community network is still in the reselling model. So we the bandwidth price are still uh, very uh, quite expensive. Uh, we still try to advocate to our government to have a wholesale access to get the bandwidth. So okay, we can have more affordable price and uh, to provide the uh, service. But uh, up to now, we able to save money around twenty thousand. Uh, uh, dollar which we allocate for reinvestment to expand our uh, service up to now starting from one uh, particular uh, uh, hamlets in Chittagelar we already have expand our uh, service to more than uh, 34 uh, different hamlets and three uh, different uh, village with a daily uh, user uh, up to uh, 2000 uh, user a day so uh, this is some of the documentations of activities we developed in Indonesia. And the last picture is uh, actually a very special to us because this is came from 2020 when we uh, facilitated the first online classes for uh, farmer uh, community in uh, Chittaglar. And currently this uh, group of farmer already uh, able to develop their business. Uh, thanks to uh, internet, so they can access uh, the market and uh, uh, expand their uh, business uh, to fulfill their uh, daily needs. And thank you also for all uh, partners that are uh, supporting our activities uh, up to now, but from our experience, the challenges are still uh, uh, very big and there are still a long way to go uh, in order to make this community network infrastructure uh, able to address the uh, uh, digital divide challenges in Indonesia and beyond. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Pa. I think it was a very good uh, illustration of some of the questions that Carlos brought up in terms of issues around geography, diversity, you know, forest areas that you have to connect up. I love the five L's, your definition of what a uh, community network is. I think that's something that's easy for people to follow with and also the concepts around brainware. So thank you for sharing. There is a question in the chat to you. Maybe if you could answer, it was about whether your materials were available in English. But since we have to move on, uh, maybe if you could just answer that in the chat. So next, I'm going to just do a framing for you as to how and why the technology Innovations for Sustainable Development Platform uh, run by ICEA fits into this picture before we get into a multi-stakeholder uh, panel discussion about how the different partnerships can be uh, brought together. So uh, very quickly, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the co-convener of the Technology Innovations for Sustainable Development Platform. Uh, the other co-convener is Professor Albert Teo. Um, and we have ICEA, APC, and Angels of Impact as one of the initial co-leads and uh, we're hoping to bring on more partnerships, which is why we want to share with you what the vision of this platform is. So the next slide will show you how there are actually five key areas that we're looking at around why such a platform exists. And I think from the first two speaker setting context, you can see that there's very many different elements. There's bandwidth affordability, there's community of practice. So basically the five key areas that we're gonna be focusing on as we seed and grow and mainstream community networks, really linking it with social enterprise and sustainable local economic development. And that's the strength and uh, contribution that I see a network brings into this uh, conversation. So building community of practice, uh, having resources flow to fund these community networks through a social enterprise innovation fund, projecting collective impact, influencing government policies and programs, and really engaging resource institutions, business sectors, and multilaterals into having this conversation and making it happen. As I mentioned earlier, I've been involved in bridging the digital divide since 1986 when Sir Donald Maitland wrote the Maitland Report on the importance of connect uh, connectivity at the last mile, but we're still struggling it with it today because as Doreen Bogdan mentioned in uh, what Carlos referred to, business as usual doesn't cut it. 
Uh, next slide. So this platform has been in existence uh, for a while, and we have many amazing participants who have been driving this, including Pat Gustav and also Dr. Sarbani, who is also on this call. Um, so organized three Asia-Pacific learning center, uh, sessions in last year, one around the models of community networks, bridging the digital divide and enabling the last mile connectivity, looking at community networks, all the different issues and challenges and prospects, and really addressing what are the policies and regulations that will be able to help bridging the digital divide. Because as we all know, the telecom industry is a highly regulated industry. So there's different processes from ISPs. And now the next conversation is how do we bridge the community network divide from a policy and regulatory point of view as well. Uh, next slide. So out of that, we also participated in many Asia Pacific regional uh, networks who are also in the process of discussing community networks. So in 2021, we attended the Asia Pacific Regional Community Network Summit in Bangkok. Uh, also in September last year, the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum. And more recently this year, Asia Pacific Regional Internet Conference on Operational Technologies, where these networks of people who are working on community networks, we can all come together to actually make this happen in a more systematic way. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the other things that we're currently working on is that we managed to get a grant from ICIF. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes, so uh, the grant that was received from APNIC Foundation, which we are very grateful for, Sylvia, uh, covers the period from the beginning of this year till the end of the year. And there will be uh, three key organizations, uh, four key organizations that will be working on this. So in Bangladesh, uh, it'll be a cellular router system connecting fair trade value change stakeholders led by an organization called Prakriti, which is women organizations and artisans, product designers, quality checkers, and marketing channels. This is kind of touches on what Carlos talked about, meaningful connectivity. Uh, in China, there's a virtual platform enabling smallholder farmers to document, share, and showcase knowledge on quality food production, biodiversity conservation, sustainable farming, local cultural practices, and utilizing text, photos, and videos, and other forms to be able to connect up. Next slide, please. In the Philippines, uh, we're working with the Philippines Rural Reconstruction Movement and Philippines Coffee Alliance to use ICT to improve productivity, efficiency, and incomes of women and men, small-scale producers, and other stakeholders in coffee and sustainable agricultural value. And last but not least, working with the regional partner APC in expanding the work that we do uh, to really make this happen in this project. And then last but not least, uh, some of our initial plans as we launch uh, this platform is to also uh, look at ways in which social impact measurements could be made of these projects so that this becomes clearer for potential investors, partners to know exactly on that impact that these communities are making on the UNSGs, for example. Participation to and organizing in uh, regional uh, events will continue, such as the upcoming Asia Pacific Digital Rights Festival. Resource mobilization is where we're looking at seeing how technical assistance as well as funding can come in to seed and grow community networks as social enterprises or as uh, entities that are supporting technological innovations to bridge the digital divide. And then last but not least, working on how we can co-develop an Asia-Pacific regional advocacy agenda and plan so we can advocate for the enabling policies to mainstream community networks to bridge the digital divide. And I'll really underscore that this is an important area because as I mentioned, I've been working on this for many, many years, but until we can fix this last mile of enabling policies, uh, many community networks do still struggle uh, on creating affordability because they, there may be limitations on what they can do. And advocacy for enabling policies to mainstream social enterprises as well towards inclusive recovery, building back fairer and accelerating the SDGs through community networks, either as running as a social enterprise, as well as social enterprises being able to be enabled by community networks. So this, in a nutshell, gives you some ideas of the initial works of this platform. And on that light, we would like to then open up a conversation uh, on a panel discussion around how we could all work together on enabling platforms uh, together. So 
for the multi-stakeholder discussion, we have three speakers with us. Uh, we will open up with Adrian Wan, who is the Senior Policy Advocacy Manager at the Internet Society. So Adrian, uh, would love if you could introduce yourself, the work that ISOC does around community networks and how you see um, that plugging into the technology platform. Adrian. Certainly. Thank you, Lina. Uh, and thank you to all our friends and partners here for having us uh, at this beautiful event, gathering so many you know, beautiful minds and ideas. Uh, I'm really amazed. So uh, I, as uh, Lina said, I'm, I'm Adrian. I'm based in Singapore. I work in the Internet Society, uh, have been here for more than four years. I now co-lead uh, the Connecting the Unconnected project with an, another colleague of mine. Uh, it's a global project. Uh, it's called Connecting the Unconnected. It, it used to be called Community Networks. We're calling it, you know, we're giving it a slightly wider scope because we realized uh, we also need to, as others have said uh, previously, look at other complementary access solutions and not just CN. Some of them are like muni municipal networks. Some of them are co cooperatives, right? But so we 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 hope to uh, cover as you know as as wide uh, a spectrum as possible. But let me go into a few slides and uh, run you through a few uh, introductory uh, items. Start sharing here. Um, well, really happy to see everyone here today. But I I'm not sure if uh, all of you know about. The Internet Society. So here's a really brief introduction. Um, we are a global nonprofit uh, founded in in 1992 by uh, the, the creators of of the internet. So for us, the internet is the most important global resource to um, to emerge in recent history and. And it's integral to every aspect of, of our society. For, for the past 30 years or so, we have worked to safeguard uh, this open architecture and integrity of the internet, and also to expand worldwide access to it. Um, I'm moving on. If you don't know anything about us, uh, th this is a good good place to start. We we think the internet is for everyone. Um, currently, it, 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 it is arguable if, if, it, if it's for everyone. And that's why we have this aspiration, right, that it should be, and it is for everyone. And that's why we're working on connecting the unconnected so that it is for everyone and to make it a, a bigger internet and a stronger one. But now, as, as we all know, we don't have to go over this, uh, close to 3 billion people remain unconnected. And that's why our work here is so important. Um, we have been in the, in the business of uh, working with communities world, worldwide to, to fund, to build and train people with the skills needed to run and maintain community networks for for over 10 years uh, around the world. Uh, in fact, it began in, in the APEC region uh, uh, in, in, in the very beginning. So uh, we're really interested in uh, seeing this uh, global movement take off so that you know, we, we increasingly we're thinking uh, not only how many communities we can directly uh, work with and support, but also how our action can enable others to do the same for many other communities so that you know, there's a the multiplier effect. Uh, I'll go into that in a bit. So basically, uh, Lina asked, asked me to talk about our work on community networks. These are the four main areas. The first is community building, deployment, training, and, and policy. It's not too dissimilar to, to what uh, uh, many of our friends here are doing. Uh, what perhaps is uh, 
of interest, I wouldn't say different, it, it, it's, it's of interest is uh, on community building uh, and, and on uh, deployment, we do run a funding uh, program uh, that is offered by the Internet Society Foundation. Uh, that is, applications are open now, by the way, I'll be, I'll be dropping a link to the page uh, in the chat in a moment so that all of you who are interested in uh, you know, sh either sharing the message out or to, uh, to applying uh, yourself uh, can have a look. Uh, so, so funds will be you know, within the realms of uh, 15 to, to 40K if it's a new network. Uh, uh, and then there, there will be a lot of other you know, uh, criteria to, to, for us to, to select uh, which, which ones to, to support. But on deployment, uh, we, we do work with uh, local partners. As you, as, you, as you know, we are a global organization and you know, truth be told, we, we cannot have the local knowledge that, that many of us uh, in, in, on this call have about in a, a specific locality. And that's why it's really important, we understand, to work with local partners on understanding. I, 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 so, someone in the chat asked about, before you, you reach out to, a, before you, you work on deployments, do you consider you know, the uh, social or anthropological aspects of, uh, of things? I, I feel these are really valid, uh, valuable questions. And, and, and that's what uh, we try to value as well when, when, wherever we go to work. On uh, what we're doing uh, last year, uh, we had this. We made these uh, pledges to at the ITU Partners to Connect forum to support 100 complementary access solutions by 2025. We also made a second pledge to train 10,000 people to build and maintain internet infrastructure. And what do we mean by uh, by the first pledge, supporting 100 complementary act activity uh, connectivity solutions? Uh, and, and, and what about the, the, the second part? By training, what, what, what do we offer? So, so that's, I'll be, I'll be going over you know, this quickly. On training, we do have a, we do have a learning platform and we, we have uh, uh, a couple of courses on offer including this, there's a really popular one called Designing and Deploying Computer Networks. Uh, that's a, a, a really suitable course if you're only learning the, the basics of how to connect, uh, 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 how to connect you know, computers to, to networks and, and so on. Uh, but the latest course we launched is the last one on the list here, Community Networks Readiness Assessment Course. So this is for local organizations to assess. Uh, now you have an idea of setting up a community network. Is it feasible? You know, what, what kind of uh, uh, measurements or, or matrices you should be looking at? There's a tool, this is a toolkit to help you know, community leaders or champions to find uh, and mobilize uh, uh, communities to build, operate, and build their own community network infrastructure. So all, all these courses are, are, are offered in three uh, languages, English, French, and, and Spanish. Uh, and we, we do hope to uh, offer more courses. Uh, but by the way, these are all free. You just need an account, and, and then these will be, some of them will be guided. Uh, so, and, and moving on to the com complementary uh, connectivity solutions here, I won't be spending too much time here because because basically these are mostly community networks we're looking for, and uh, and that is and that this brings us to be stopping sharing here, and and that is why uh, you know partnership and working with all of you here is so key. We can't do this alone, uh, and. It was so wonderful hearing you know, Carlos and uh, Lina and, and Gustav talk about your, your experience and your views. Uh, uh, Lina, you asked me about what, what I thought uh, about uh, uh, the ICEA 
and 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 the and the agenda that you showed in your slides. I, I and in, in one of your slides, you mentioned the plan to embark on this advocacy campaign targeting the Asia Pacific region. I feel that is crucial. Uh, at the Internet Society, we've done something similar in other regions. Uh, as I was uh, uh, having a chat with Carlos recently, uh, we may not have done so uh, with, even with, with the partners in this region. So, so how can we really unlock changes and enable more people to do it? Perhaps it's to first paint a really clear, uh, uh, accessible lens, policy landscape, uh, uh, so that people know what's what's okay and what's not, and what to look out for. So, but I, I have we have a lot of ideas to to talk about, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, giving it back to you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I think that's very helpful for people to understand the various things you're doing, especially with the new commitment to 2025 that people can apply to be part of, and also the suggestion of the area of uh, policy and advocacy. And as you said, ISOC has been involved in this long term. I had the opportunity of attending the developing country workshop from the 90s and seeing the early work as well. So I think it's a nice flow for us to go next to Sylvia Cadena, who is the head of programs and partnerships at APNIC Foundation, because APNIC has also been playing a very key role in this region. So the floor is yours, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Lina. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here and address this lovely group. And as, uh, as many of you have already said, it's just really heartwarming to, to see so many people committed for so long uh, that are actually uh, crystallizing some of the long discussions that have been around for many years in the community. Um, so I am, I'm also have a, a pack of slides, but besides the, the things that I want to formally uh, share with you guys, um, I would like to also um, mentioned kind of like on the side that there have been a lot of historical conversations around uh, doing connecting the connected, connecting communities, uh, doing the last mile. You know, the language has changed over the years, but many of the organizations in the spaces where those discussions that happen remain. And I would like to pull a plug here uh, just to encourage you all to participate at the Internet Governance Forum coming in Japan at the end of the year because there are many of these conversations started there or uh, flourished there, or I met many of you there. So I, I really, it doesn't come that often to the region. And the, there's been a long time coming to Asia and it's a great opportunity for all of us to get back there and, and, and do some more um, collaboration in that space. There is a session that we did back in 2016 um, when the idea was in Geneva that was about changing the paradigm of um, content content networks and infrastructure ownership. And a lot of the concepts that Carlos uh, talked about were discussed back then. I so participated in that panel. Many folks from um, that are in other regions participating in the space uh, participated there. And I think it's really fantastic to see all of those concepts developed and uh, taking flesh and, you know, into this platform that ICEA um, is um, putting together, which we are very proud and very honored to be able to fund and support. So with that, just give me a second and I um, get my slides up. I hope that you can see them now in presenter mode. Can you? Yes, okay. we can. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, well, as uh, you may know, uh, APNIC has its own um, foundation. Um, so I'm going to go back to the mothership a little bit and talk about what APNIC is. So APNIC is the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. We allocate IP addresses and ASM numbers across 56 um, Asia Pacific um, economies. And our role is very technical to the, the routing and operation of the internet in the region. Um, we have about 16,000 members uh, that connect um, to our uh, uh, services that are uh, critical for the operation of the internet in, in Asia Pacific. And we collaborate globally to make sure that those, um, uh, that networks are interconnected and, and supported. So we 
APNIC supports a lot of other things that the foundation uh, is not really involved. So I, I encourage you all to have a look at the APNIC.net website, the research that is done there, uh, the APNIC Academy services that are there, uh, subscribe to the blog and, and keep track of the things that the, the technical community is, is doing in that space. So with that, uh, back in 2017, APNIC decided to establish its own foundation, originally registered in Hong Kong, now registered in Hong Kong and in Australia. Uh, our mission is to increase investment in internet development uh, in the region. And that is through a very broad um, number of projects and uh, initiatives. So, but I want to highlight that we are not only at, um, a, uh, an organization that provides funding to the community, but we fundraise for the community to be able to expand internet development in the region. So these partnerships that are um, being discussed today, uh, many of those partnerships require funding partnerships. So we are very open to the possibility of um, putting our, our, our um, uh, resources and uh, our team at the service of this group to support fundraising efforts, uh, efforts that support the, the platform uh, for community networks to develop um, in the region. And that map shows you just a sample of the projects that were uh, the, our coverage in 2021. The uh, annual report for 2022 is coming up in the next few months. The foundation is structured across three big programs uh, that are the buckets. Uh, as you were, that are um, the infrastructure inclusion and knowledge uh, programs. Um, infrastructure covers a number of what we call focus areas, which are, when you look at the website, they are a little bit vague and that's on purpose because the idea is that we try to help people to identify their work with the work that we are doing so that we can slowly build uh, align alignment in things that are constantly changing as the internet continues to develop. Um, Going back to what Gustav presented about the brainware, uh, probably the knowledge program, program will sit on the brainware challenge, the inclusion uh, program um, focused on um, the, 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 the people that are behind that are gonna use it and the infrastructure program focused on the hardware and software that is required to, to uh, operate uh, the internet at different levels. So not only on community networks space, and you can have a look at the, the list of projects uh, there. We have three funding mechanisms available for the community. The Easy Fascia grants, the call for proposals is open. Sorry, it actually closes on the 30th of April. So my apologies for the not correct information on the slide. Um, the foundation grants that are by invitation only, uh, that are uh, on a rolling basis in our four, um, projects that doesn't necessarily fit into the ECFASIA grants, but that are of relevance uh, to the community. And the Trust Discretionary Fund, which is a sort of a sponsorship um, initiative that we are managing on behalf of our biggest donor, the Asia Pacific Internet Development Trust. And that covers global organizations as well, not only APAC, but it's not um, uh, driven by us and it's not through a, an open call or things like that. It, the approach to that is slightly uh, different. So the focus of, of my conversation with you today is the next uh, couple of slides is that the Easy Fascia uh, mechanism is a quite large established uh, fund that has been operating for 15 years in the region. Um, and it has supported 152 projects in total um, at the moment. Uh, this is the slide for the, the the figures for 2021 that matches the annual report that I showed before, but as of, as of this as of now, it's 120 and 52 through 31 uh, economies. The ones in the green columns that you see there are a small scale up and impact grants. It's different sizes, as you can see, 30,000 all the way to 150,000 um, for different stages of development for different kinds of project that sits under the inclusion, infrastructure and knowledge uh, program areas, right? So you have on each of those programs, a number of focus areas where you could align your work and then apply for that specific um, fund that will support that. We understand that with funding as with many other uh, things, um, 
these are all kind of part of a puzzle. So when I try to explain to, to applicants that are interested to apply to our funding, I would say, look, if you are working on education, for example, and you are applying to the Global Education Fund for a grant, they will be asking all of these questions around your education outcomes, the KPIs, the what is the curriculum, what is that they're going to learn, and all of those issues around education, which is what they care most about, right? And then the challenges that you may have, for example, on deploying a internet uh, technologies, uh, they will either not understand uh, what it is that that is that you're saying, they don't want that much detail, and they just kind of trust that that's going to happen at some point. So the internet is part of that education uh, proposal, but it's never at the center of that application. And in our case, if you were to apply to funding for us, it would be the other way around. We want to know how you're going to deploy that network or that those devices, what software is that you're going to use, what it is that you're going to do, and all of that technical information that for other donors is not necessarily that important. So when you look at a platform for funding, uh, what we are trying to, to uh, showcase is that there is a space for different donors to support different parts of that puzzle so that the organizations that are working in the field can have multiple sources of income that support multiple areas of development of their projects in different ways and capacities so that it is important that you build the relationships with those donors based in the needs of your organization and projects moving forward, but not put everything into one, um, one source of, of uh, income for, for those organizations. Um, so, and, and also be very clear of what state of the stage of development your, your projects are. They're, they're, you know, from small scale up and impact, that's how we name them, let's say, but there are different donors that also address different kinds of, of uh, labels or attach different kinds of labels to the funding that they have available, just to make sure that uh, people understand what type of risk that donor is taking on when they put money into the, the table uh, for a particular uh, initiative. So in, in that space, I think that the platform, and as, as Lina mentioned uh, before, has um, identified funding as one of the issues. Um, funding for what and funding for with whom and in collaboration and how collaboration uh, works in that space is something that the, this, this group will need to uh, you know, come to an agreement and an understanding of, of how in, in, in why those kind of things uh, happen. We also have um, the, the column in yellow, the IPv6 deployment uh, grants. Our grants that are very, I don't know if you know, the, the people in the room um, know what IPv6 is, but it's, you know, it's, it's on IP addresses, it's kind of like very core to our work, but you can go and have a look at what it is and, and what your networks might need or may not need IPv6 in their deployment. And we are, supporting organizations on adopting uh, IPv6 in the region, um, just to make sure that the, the range of IP addresses that are available in the region is able to support the population growth and the number of devices that is required in this region to be able to actually say that we are connecting, they are connected. Um, and then we also have a, a small uh, price for organizations that are doing remarkable um, uh, contributions have done remarkable contributions to the development of the internet in the region, and we are expecting to have the awards ceremony at the IGF in Japan, and we hope that you guys uh, join us uh, there. So with that, I wanted to give you uh, a, just a very, very brief uh, summary of the projects that are actually currently ongoing. These are um, not projects so complete. Yeah, is it possible yes. to wrap up because we are we're ending at twelve fifteen and we still need to give Anju the floor? Yes, sorry. Um, so this okay. this slide just shows you the the list of projects that are currently ongoing that are linked to the community networks uh, frame or whatever is the connectivity for communities is how we call it and on inclusion infrastructure and knowledge. You can see what areas of focus they are how many organizations and how many economies, and this is the number of um, organizations. And I have um, shared the slides that they can be available for you guys later that have a number of examples with photos and more information about some of these 
uh, projects. So with that, I give the floor back to you, uh, Laina, and thank you very much for the opportunity to address this room. Thank you, Sylvia. As someone who's been involved in APNIC from its early founding days, I've actually watched you really grow this program and really contribute to the region. So thank you for the work you do. Um, I, uh, to the audience, we are hoping to be able to have a little bit of Q&A. I think Goma mentioned that we could, for those of you who want to stay on, we can stay on. Um, but I think it's very important we hear as well from our last but not least speaker, Anju Manjal, who is the head of Asia Pacific for the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership. So Anju, Anju the floor is yours. Thanks, Lina and friends. I'll keep it short, I promise. It's nice to join you today, particularly champions working on community networks. Um, just to let everyone know that I'm not a community network expert on the ground, but I have technical computer science, computer networks background. Um, I used to do a lot of work on telecenters during the ice age periods, but now I am focusing a lot on policies and regulatory frameworks. Um, and in regards to your presentation, Lina, I'll just focus on government policies and influence that we've been doing uh, because Carlos has already covered uh, data, Sylvia has covered communities, Adrian and Gustav has already covered a lot of the work that they are doing. So I'm just going to keep it very simple. Um, so just quickly before I uh, uh, before I talk about uh, some of the work that we are doing, Carlos mentioned the Alliance for Affordable Internet Research and Data, and I just wanted to say that you know from the team that successfully championed affordable and meaningful connectivity in the last ten years. We are now called the Global Digital Inclusion. Um, so there's quite a lot of work that we are doing. We continue. We're still on track, um, but we went through a transition period. So we continue to build on community expertise, um, leading evidence-based policy reform. I just want to, you know, emphasize it's always evidence-based. Um, without evidence-based research and data, we don't go into the country. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is uh, in low and middle-income countries. And again, as Carlos and the rest of them mentioned, affordability and meaningful connectivity policy is very key. And Anything that we do, we ensure that it is a multi-stakeholder and an inclusive process um, when we are working with communities. So it has to be meaningful to someone sitting in a remote community who struggles affordable device, uh, sorry, who struggles to have affordable devices or affordable data or a person with disability who cannot afford assistive device. So when we look at the entire community network ecosystem, we think about even a person sitting in the remote island, you know, with very, with very basic uh, connectivity like 2G. So just migrating them through policymakers is, is key. So just to uh, quickly uh, respond again to your question, um, Partnership is very key to us, and I, I, I just want to say that through our partnerships with ISOC, um, APNIC, APC, ITU, and other key organizations, we've supported um, a lot of the webinars, a lot of the knowledge sharing opportunities, but a lot of the work that we are doing is to make sure that we are targeting the policy makers and the regulators. Um, so we continue to also work with experts like Carlos, Navid, Rajneesh, um, Adrian, Sylvia, John, Garretti. There's so many, uh, Jonathan, Brad, Sarbani, Ashish, and I to you um, to not reinvent the wheel because it's very important. We sort of complement the efforts that are already going on. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, our key stakeholders, without them, uh, we wouldn't be relevant. So just a few quick examples of our direct interventions. We worked closely together with, sorry, I'm a little sick as well, to, uh, with the Digital Empowerment Foundation in India and Internet Society to organize webinars on community networks. Um, so looking at the cross-regional lessons and good practices, we last year we worked with the Digital Empowerment Foundation to produce case studies targeting women engineers and females um, leading community networks. So we're hoping to publish that case studies in the next few, few months. Um, and a lot of our work, as I mentioned earlier, is focused on meaningful connectivity. So last year we worked with countries like Bangladesh to develop their broadband national policy. And one of the key targets or pillars for the new policy 
was specifically to support community networks in Bangladesh. In the 2009 national broadband policy, community networks was not mentioned. So through consultations with regulators and telecommunication and, and you know, just getting community leaders, particularly women to discuss the potential of running community networks, we made sure that there was key targets and pillars in the new broadband policy. So currently they're working uh, on the validation. And, you know, I just want to say, give all credit to Bangladesh Telecommunication Regulatory Commission, A2I, and the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication. We also added a very important key pillar and target to support community networks in the draft PNG broadband policy and universal access policy. Um, so consultations were done last year with colleagues Judith, I believe she's online, and David Townsend. And this again was all complementary work done by the PNG government. We were just making sure that we were connecting the dots to make sure that it's inclusive and including um, those key targets supporting the community networks. Um, and uh, just um, one other comment, uh, one of the most important part of all this work um, is to ensure that we are gender responsive and inclusive, you know, when we design policy making because Yes, we are focused on evidence-based research and da data, but we need to make sure that the policymakers in particular, in particular understand inclusive, what the word inclusive is. They understand that we need to bring in the key stakeholders like um, public and private sector, academia, civil societies, and other key sectors. So a lot of our engagements included like women from like uh, from the communities, the SME communities, the persons with disabilities that are working on meaningful connectivity. And a lot of them came also, you know, we were able to bring them to the forum uh, from the uh, from the other uh, communities. So we, we continue to make sure that, you know, they are part of the conversation with the policymakers. And I just wanted to say that just recently, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority and UNESCO just uh, did a validation workshop on the digital gender strategy, again, focusing on reducing the digital gender divide. And a lot of the consultations that happened outside of Islamabad were targeting um, how can they support in a community networks and also community uh, you know, just centers, community centers, Wi-Fi centers, public Wi-Fi uh, for these women. So again, you know, I just want to keep it simple because there's so much we can talk about, but I know we are running out of time and I know you want to kind of go to the uh, to the team uh, and also to um, to the audience. Thank you, Anju. I think your passion came across very clearly. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I haven't heard the word telecenters in a long time since yeah. you mentioned it. And I also do love the fact that you are looking not just as women as beneficiaries of technology, but also the drivers of technology, because that's what Angel Spempack does as well. We So that resonated very well with me. So I believe Goma has indicated that we can have a few more minutes. We are mindful that there are other side events going on. Um, there are There have been any uh, those of you who want to ask questions, I would appreciate if you could do the hands up so I can call on you or uh, Gomer or put it in the chat. So a quick one on the chat, uh, Sylvia, there was a question about whether the funding is specific to Asia region or is it for Africa as well? It's only for the Asia Pacific, 56 economies we call. Yeah, that's why it's called ICIF at Asia, right? <laughs> ICIF Asia, yeah. All right. And then there was a Someone uh, wanted to know if academics with programs and entrepreneurship will be able to get funding as well for community yeah. engagement. Uh, from our from our program, every type of organization that is legally registered in any Asia Pacific country is eligible. We don't uh, support individuals, but if they have backing from a registered organization, we are very happy to support. And I see also a question from Dinesh about examples of evidence. Um, if you can have a look at the uh, list of published reports from ISIF, all the four the completed grants have their, their reports published. And there are many that are offered examples about how they have done uh, connectivity for communities. However, as we, are, as we are a neutral organization, we don't advocate specifically publicly on uh, specific models, but those can be used uh, as examples mm -hmm. in the I think Dinesh wanted Anju to respond as well. Uh, I'm just looking at the question. Sorry, Example, Dinesh. My... Examples in, of evidence and inclusion that can be used for policy work. 
Um, so, sorry, are you asking to provide some examples or I've given you two examples, but um, we've done, for example, gender scorecards. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick example. So gender scorecards research in Samoa, PNG and uh, Tonga. And uh, there were five key themes focusing on reducing the digital gender divide. So we did they, the, the, we worked with the PNG digital ICT cluster, Tonga Women in ICT, and Samoa Women in ICT, and also Technology Association to uh, collect evidence-based data and research to support some of the work that they are doing, but also to look at how to reduce the digital gender divide in the in um, in the context of rural community networks, but also um, it was linked to internet empowerment for women in in the rural communities and looking at uh, online safety, etc. So it's quite broad. I can also share that information with you shortly. <laughs> okay. That's, so you're that's saying so many the, examples. Are, the examples of evidence. The evidence is wide. It could be from safety to many yes. different metrics that are used. Okay, great. There's I'll a let Sorry, and there's this question here from UNICEF Anupna. She wants to know, are you also training local communities in the safe usage of internet, especially for children, since common networks are also connecting schools? Any one of you can jump in. <laughs> Who would like to take the question? Carlos, I see you smiling. Do you want to answer that? Because I know you had a beautiful example. Uh, beautiful answer last week at our Thai conference. <laughs> No, no, no. Actually, I wanted to uh, to point to Gustav because they've been doing quite a lot of thought around that. But uh, uh, well, last week what I said, which is something that I'm going to keep on saying for some time, is that safety in the internet doesn't only apply to to community networks, right? It applies to everyone who is connecting to any internet network and the vulnerabilities for people and the threats for people are are there regardless of one network or another, right? not only community networks. I think where community networks are different is that they offer a possibility of a conversation where this thing can be put on the table and, and this potential threat to the communities can be put on the table and discuss and explore alternatives on how to address it. Whereas in the case of many of the other traditional top-down operators, connectivity is provided without the proper discussion about the potential impact that is going to have on the communities and therefore in their agency and their autonomy and whatnot. So rather than what is done, and others can answer there, it's more about how it is done. Because mm. we need cyber hygiene practices, we need a safe internet mm -hmm. in yeah. all networks, not only on community networks. Correct. And I think it ties in with what Adrian talked about earlier as earlier as well about the local partners that have the context, right? So I think, Pat Gustav, you probably will agree with that, right? By working through community partners, they have the context. Well, we have to contextualize our approach because uh, I think there are no such uh, single policy and approach for community network development. So we have to adjust and customize everything uh, because um, uh, each area has their own cultural and social situations. But in terms of policy, it's, I think it's different game. Like in Indonesia, uh, many different, uh, uh, like some uh, different ministries and agencies have some uh, affirmative uh, policy to support the uh, uh, internet infrastructure development in rural areas and remote places. But it not means that it can be implemented easy, easily. So there are many different challenges uh, from policy disseminations, some people doesn't have any uh, uh, clue what is the policy is all about. And, and one thing that is also quite challenging is that uh, we have uh, many uh, like uh, different layers of governments, which also making it uh, quite challenging to integrate different policies from different level, uh, level of governments. And in, in grassroots level, uh, the community have problems to understand uh, how to work with the, with the policy and regulatory uh, framework. So, Apart from technical uh, stuff that we are working on, uh, one of the challenges is also in the policy and regulations, and one one other is uh, 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 like in social and and, and, and cultural uh, context. So we have to contextualize our approach, and it's not an easy task. Uh, 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 all this, uh, but I think each experience uh, have uh, uh, 
uh, important uh, role to, uh, uh, to to collect uh, knowledge uh, that are can be shared to uh, other in order to expand this uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And I believe that some of your materials that you've created also helps people understand these issues, right? Yeah. yeah. Our, our biggest challenge is how to make complicated things become easy to understand. And that is a quite uh, interesting uh, role, actually. Mm -hmm. Great. And I see Sylvia has also given an answer in the chat box. I'd really encourage the panelists as well. Uh, please um, feel free to take that. I'm just trying to take as many questions as I see. There's a question here from Michael Sontak from Myanmar. And it's interesting because he's referring to community radio, which we know was another way of doing telecenters back then. So is there any funding resources available for implementing community radio using FM frequency? Would anyone like to since uh, Adrian, you mentioned that you went beyond <laughs> community networks, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I, I can uh, give it a go. But my, Michael, uh, one of so what, one of the things we look out for is is a connection to the internet. Ultimately, it may not be you know from the very beginning because it it takes time and and planning and in different stages for communities to be ready for for that stage right but uh for us it's important that you know, ultimately let's be part of the internet and make the internet bigger and stronger together i think sylvia mentioned yes so you want to say a quick word on that yes we have supported projects that involved um uh, radio frequencies um in different ways uh, so it has been um internet, uh, limited internet access to a point where then the community radio expands the information into the community. So just always trying to link it to where the internet makes sense, but mm -hmm. understanding that it sometimes it takes time for that internet to be uh, broadly available for the community. So there are different um, alternatives, let's say, so that slowly the, the access can be built upon the demand and then figuring out how how that uh, happens one one of the projects that was supporting that uh, was actually in Borneo um, some of the long houses where they had one um, a hotspot that received uh, some of the radio radio programming they will come into the long house download the radio program in USB sticks and then go in other areas of Borneo and then get together in other longhouses and listen to the radio uh, program outside of the internet. But it's that, it's that bit of really trying to understand what that actually means to get a piece of information from A, a to B. Uh, for us that are privileged connected to the internet, it takes seconds. For others, it can, be, it can take a boat, donkey, uh, and three hours of work to be able to get that information into a community. So just keeping uh, always in mind that is is not only that the technology works, is that it reaches out to people. And I hope that uh, clarifies. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, I've actually seen this also through uh, in Pondicherry where Swaminathan's project used the community red book and the combination of internet access to actually help the community uh, not be damaged through the tsunami. They got early warning uh, system, so it, it's done. And if you look in the chat, um, Anju has shared that uh, UNS CAP funding is available as well as ITU and ISOC. And uh, Carlos has also shared some uh, models. So I would encourage you to look at that. Um, I think we are coming to the close of the session. I don't know, Goma, how much more time should we take or should we wrap up? Okay. We can take five minutes more, uh, Lina, colleagues. Can take five more minutes? Okay, brilliant. Uh, earlier, uh, unfortunately, I dropped off, so I don't have the chat from earlier. But I, what I recall, there were several questions buzzing, uh, Pat Gustav, on all your training materials, whether they're available in English, can they be more, made more available? And I believe uh, Dr. Lisa also managed uh, mentioned that that could be possibly one of the things the platform can help with. So I'll ask you if you can answer that and maybe I'll invite Dr. Lisa to say some words too. Well, yes, we are definitely interested to share. Uh, I already shared the link to uh, download all the materials. Unfortunately, all the training materials still in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, we uh, hope that we can also translate the material to different languages, but uh, please remember that uh, the, uh, it, uh, the training materials is like a living document. 
So we keep on uh, updating uh, because there is always changing, not only in technology, but also in the policy. So we need to make a lot of uh, adjustment. So maybe uh, if it's uh, possible, uh, as it is mentioned by Lisa, uh, we can have a, a learning or knowledge platform that can uh, upload all the resources and then we can uh, work on it uh, uh, together in order to have a further uh, utilizations. So yeah, we, uh, we are very open to share and translate the knowledge. Okay, and Carlos is also offering that all of us learn Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> which I recommend. It's a great language. Uh, Dr. Lisa? Uh, yes, thank you, Laina. Yes, I'm, I was intently listening to everything and absorbing everything. Um, and yes, we, are, we have had experience in you know, um, multi-country programs in Asia Pacific. And the only way that we can be more effective on the ground is to actually undertake translations for all our learning materials. So I think the platform can be relevant as a learning platform for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. So we're going to be wrapping up soon. And what I would love to do is have each panelist uh, talk a little bit more of your vision of partnership with the technology platform. Um, so can I start with you, Carlos? I guess I'll start with the three panelists first and then have Carlos wrap up. Uh, can I have uh, Anju, since you're working on partnerships? <laughs> um, I think uh, in terms of partnership, I would like to see more improved coordination and collaboration across um, ages, agencies. So nationally, um, you know, through a harmonized approach or, you know, a single source of truth, right? Um, but also in, in relation to partnership, I, we do our best to reduce duplication of efforts and minimize, you know, a lot of the, uh, it, it, the efforts that are happening on the ground. Um, so we want to continue consultations and discussions with our key partners. We want to also work with them to ensure we break the uh, partnership silos. Sometimes we're so much uh, within our inside our box. Uh, so we need to sort of look outside the box and say, okay, which partner is doing what so we don't uh, duplicate any effort. Uh, to me, that is one of the most important thing because we don't do anything, uh, you know, we don't repeat it. We don't do anything if there's another partner that's already working on it. We just want to make sure we complement everyone's work. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we want to make sure that our policymakers um, understand that it's not just about them making the decision at the top level, but we need to include other marginalized communities. So we want to work with you, Lina, and also the, the team. We're already working with them, but to continue uh, the engagement and meaningful engagement, not just to tick the box. I have to be very careful about that. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So if I take away a word from what you just said, it's complementary partnerships <laughs> as well. Thank you. Great. Sylvia? Thanks, Lina. I would I would say that the, for me, I, I'm also, my role, my role title says partnerships on it. So I'm supposed to be working on that all the time. And I guess it's um, the, the advice there or the, the, the dream there would be that there are win-win partnerships where it's not extractive. And when we um, have an opportunity for the other organization that is receiving the support to actually be seen and being understood and um, understand what the challenges are is part of building uh, real partnerships. Be uh, open enough to share what our weaknesses are and where we don't have enough resources or talent or funds or what have you. And when we make decisions and we change things to be able to be open about what drove that change in those decisions. And that, that is something that you can only do when you trust the people that you work with. And that is, is very, very important. And I, I also would like to leave a, a message to everyone and is that normally it's not that you can see partnerships or collaboration built into your budgets. So please budget for it. Having time to talk to people, having time to really listen to what they're doing, having time to open your mind to different ways of doing things. Takes time, take resources, think, take all your energy. You need you maybe an app after. So just budget for it uh, so that it, it actually happens. Otherwise, it's just this dream that we think that we are going to collaborate. 
is this dream that we are going to be aligned and that we are not going to duplicate work. But in the end, you are rushed with the announcement. You send the announcement out and you didn't talk to any of your partners. So please, uh, you know, be, be honest about what partnerships really mean and put it in your budget and in your calendar in your time so that you have time to make them happen. Thank you. Very wise words indeed. Partnership does take investment. And also another thing that you said earlier was also a key role you could play in the resource mobilization as well, I think, which is a key role you've been playing. Um, and Adrian, you alluded to the policy work. So I don't know if you want to end with that. I'll... Right. Thank you, uh, Lina. I, I was thinking what stands out from this morning's session to me is that, hey, we have this wonderful group of people here today and all coming at it from different angles. So clearly there is a, a movement going on on connecting the connected uh, using this community networks model. And you know, I think, and we think this is the time to, to do this. Uh, and so let, let's take the opportunity. We, we have a lot planned for, for the year and beyond, including you know, looking at what, what content is would be would be most useful for for you know to 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 strengthen and intensify this this movement uh, for different stakeholders and you know uh, Lina you, you you asked me for my views on the platform I I'm really interested to um, share exchange views in, information going forward and see what we can achieve together thank you absolutely thank you so much uh, I'll just um, would love Pat Gustav as a person who runs community networks, how your thoughts on partnerships are important to you? And then Carlos, and then we'll just wrap up. Uh, I have to say that uh, most of our member in Common Room is not coming from the technical background, in particular to internet infrastructure. So in the past three years, we have been learning quite a lot of things. And I think we have been lucky to be located in the perfect ecosystem uh, with generous support from our colleague from APC, from ISIF Asia, from FCDO, in, in, in national uh, level, we have a lot of uh, support from ICT Watch, Relawantik, and so on and so on. So I think uh, this partnership and multi-collaboration, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, collaboration is one of the most important key how we approach this community uh, network infrastructure development in the future. So thank you for uh, all the support and hopefully we, uh, going to continue our collaborations in the future. Thank you. Carlos? Yeah, well, um, yes to everything. Yes to everything. I think uh, everything has been said. I um, I do, when, when I was thinking about this session, it's great to see everyone coming, everyone, you know, so into each other, the amazing work that you are doing. We have here representatives from the social entrepreneurship, from the technical community, from the NGOs, from the the research, you know, like many constituencies that, that we need. I mean, this challenge is a huge challenge and we need partnerships. And uh, I think we do have those partnerships and um, as they have been said, maybe they are not coordinated. And I see this platform as a way of coordinating it. I see a lot of enthusiasm. I love enthusiasm and excitement and I'm very excited. I, uh, uh, and, and maybe, you know, going back to what Andrew said at the very beginning, it's great to see us here. Government is missing. We've tried. We've tried to get uh, them to also share and to also, you know, be within this journey. Because if something is not examples, that uh, we are not gonna, you know, it's gonna be way harder if we don't have that um, that government regulatory support, policy support on our side. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, great to, to everything, great. I mean, so happy that each and every one of you have got to see each other and talk to each other and, and, and start plotting and mapping things together and partnering together. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, let's, let's try to be more and let's try to be more effective and let's try to be pragmatic. You all know me, I'm not gonna mess around. If, if I'm behind this platform, it's because I want to get things done. Mm -hmm. So let's get to it. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you and uh, having, I'm probably the oldest in this group in the panel here. I've been involved in telecom since 86 and internet, et cetera. I, I, I'm excited to see people come together. Anju, I'll use that term from you, complementary partnerships. And also Sylvia's reminder that we need to invest 
in making partnerships. So this is indeed, Adrian, the time for us all to come together. There are amazing examples out there. I just want to commend every, each and every one of you for the great work you do, including people in the, in the, in the audience. So on that note, I believe, can we take a photograph together? So if uh, I believe, Goma, it would require everyone putting on their video. Is that correct? Yes, please. Um, if we can open our videos. Because right now I only see the panelists and the host. I don't see the audience. Um, yes, I think we can only have a photo of the panelists. Okay. There is a separate photo for attendees. Okay. So maybe, okay, so who is taking the separate photos for the attendees? Um, the team, uh, okay. Bads and Chelsea. Great. So the advice is everyone turn on your videos and a photo will be taken, whichever which one it is. <laughs> All right, Goma, go for it. Okay, three, we can't two. See you. We can't see you, Goma. You're very dark. You need your light. Sorry. Yes. Yes. There we go. Mm. Three, two, one. One more. One more. Uh, three, two, one. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Great. Together we can get Thanks, the last everyone. one connected. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Sylvia, Gustav, Carlos, Bye -bye. and you. Uh, thank you, Lina. Thanks, thank everyone. You, everybody. All right. Thanks for all the people behind the screens as well. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Ciao, ciao.